an application in my district to approve site selection and acquisition of a property located at 241 West 26th Street. This is to relocate the NYPD's bomb squad uh, to 26th Street between 7th and 8th Avenues uh, in Chelsea. This will uh, enhance their operations and productivity and it meets the NYPD's needs for a bomb squad facility. We're gonna be voting on six applications for third party transfer exemptions uh, and we can get you the list of those if you have questions on them. We're voting on uh, uh, Triple HDFC in Councilmember Ayala's district, Nueva Era in Councilmember Rodriguez's district, uh, Deschler Apartments in Councilmember Perkins's district, and then uh, as it relates to legislation. Uh, first, we're voting on a package of bills concerning the L train shutdown. Just about every New Yorker is aware by now the L train will be shutting down in April of next year for no less than 15 months. Understandably, New Yorkers on both sides of the East River are getting more and more anxious about what some people are calling the l apocalypse. I understand their concerns and I share it with them. I live a block from the L train stop at 8th Avenue in Manhattan. Um, I ride the subway all the time, as do many of my colleagues here, and I frequently ride the L train. Uh, it runs through my district, runs across town, and even people who don't live along it often use it, so the closure is going to be a very, very significant loss uh, for the entire system. I think we can all agree there are really no perfect solutions here. There will be a significant disruption to strap hangers and to residents. And my primary concern is trying to mitigate uh, the pain for subway and bus riders, pedestrians, cyclists, and neighborhood residents who live along the corridor. I am deeply concerned about tra how traffic is going to impact the quality of life for all of these groups. And it's why I'm proud to co-sponsor two bills today in this package with our Transportation Committee Chair, Idanis Rodriguez. Introduction 989A would require the Department of Transportation in coordination with the MTA to designate at least one community information center in each uh, of the boroughs affected, Manhattan and Brooklyn, during the 2019 Canarsie Tunnel reconstruction. Introduction 990A would require the commissioner of the Department of Transportation to designate an ombudsperson to receive and investigate complaints and comments in connection with the Canarsie closing starting in 2019. And resolution uh, 377, sponsored, member, uh, sponsored by Council Member Rafael Espinal, who joined us, would call upon the governor and the MTA uh, to commit to an expeditious transition to an electric bus fleet and to use electric buses as a robust part of the replacement service during the L train shutdown. I want to invite Council Member uh, Rodriguez and then Council Member Espinal to come up and speak on these bills. Thank you, Speaker, again for your leadership on putting together, working with in, in, in team, a team with MTA, Mayor's Office and all of us to be sure that we respond to all those questions that the riders who use the L train has about what is the plan that we have during those months of construction. And as you know, the MTA came to testify in a hearing that we also, the speaker and I, will led together. And they said that they have a plan on how the construction, reconstruction of the train will be, will happen on time and that will not be so expensive as all the projects. That's why those two bills a prime, prime that the speaker and I and hand leading he we've been the co prime and established one the ambus person that will be working to facilitate a process on how we're gonna be watching on the MTA to be sure that the project the work is doing on time and that also is save money from taxpayer. The other piece is about creating information center. So we hope again that uh, the council with the leadership with Speaker Johnson and all of us, together with the MTA and the mayor's office, will be able to continue working with the plan to be sure that during the months of construction, we reduce as much as possible uh, uh, the negative impact that we know it will happen, but no one asked for Sandy. Sandy came as part of the natural disaster that is affecting our society. And today we have to put together a plan, and for me, it's an honor to be working with the speaker and the rest of my colleagues on those two bills that the speaker is leading. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. 
Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the speaker uh, and especially uh, the chair, Donis Rodriguez, uh, for pushing my resolution forward. My resolution uh, simply calls on the MTA and the governor uh, to do the best they can to uh, ensure that we have electric bus fleets in our roads uh, when the L train does shut down. Uh, currently, the, the MTA committed to a 10 bus pilot. Uh, the advocates and myself do not think that's enough. They're talking about purchasing 200 uh, diesel fueled buses and putting them into North Brooklyn and Lower Manhattan, which we know uh, has some of the worst air quality that the city has to offer. Uh, each bus, each diesel bus is the equivalent of having 22 cars in our roads. 200 buses is equivalent to having over 4,000 cars on our roads, and the MTA has to do everything in it can, its power to use this opportunity uh, to introduce a, a, a green bus fleet. So I just really want to thank uh, the Sierra Club and the board member, Darren Aronofsky, who have been leading this fight locally, uh, and all of the advocates that have gotten behind this bill, and my colleagues for voting on this resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll vote on uh, a bill of mine, introduction 954A, which would allow individuals to self-attest when changing the sex designation on their birth record to conform to their gender identity. The bill will also allow individuals who don't identify exclusively as male or female to change the sex designation on their birth certificate to X and other category. Uh, this legislation will make New York birth certificates more inclusive for all and will send a powerful signal to the world that New York government works for everyone. Now more than ever, it's important for us selected officials to show our constituents that we see them, that we have their backs, and we respect uh, them for who they are. We do that today by voting on this bill. Next, introduction 447A, sponsored by Councilmember Danny Drum, would require the Department of Correction to post quarterly and yearly reports on uh, departmental facility and housing area lockdowns. Such reports include information on average duration of lockdowns, the average number of individuals affected by such lockdowns, mandated services, either canceled or delayed due to a lockdown, and the reason for lockdown. So I invite Councilmember Drum to speak on this bill. Thank you very much, Speaker. Today's vote on intro 447A signals this council's ongoing commitment to reforming our jails, which means shining a light on some of the more troubling practices. I feel fortunate to be working alongside Speaker Johnson and Chair Powers, who both understand the status quo cannot continue. We must work to ensure Rikers and any future facilities do not replicate the mistakes of the past. Through media reports and conversations with advocates, including the Jails Action Coalition, the problem of unscheduled lock-ins, which include facility-wide lockdowns, became apparent. Periods of lock-in that exceed the legally allowed time limit are incredibly disruptive to the functioning of the facilities as well as to the lives of detained individuals and experiences of visitors. Locking in detained individuals at unscheduled times and suspending the movement of others can have a devastating ripple effect. For example, individuals fighting their cases miss critical legal appointments, while those who are fighting illnesses miss critical medical appointments. Visitors also feel the impact. One especially egregious incident happened last year when children, the elderly, and the sick suffered for hours on a crowded bus with no clear DOE, DOC policy in place. Intro 447 seeks to gather information on the scope and magnitude of the problem. My hope is that better tracking of the issue will encourage improved procedures to the benefit of visitors, staff, and incarcerated individuals. Thank you. Thank you. The next bill we're voting on is a resolution calling upon the United States Congress to pass and the President to sign the establishing of a Humane Immigration Enforcement System Act. It's uh, H.R. 6361, legislation that would abolish the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. I want to invite the resolution's co-sponsors, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal and Immigration Chair Carlos Menchaca, who's not with us yet, to come up and speak on this measure. I'll just roll around now. Sure. Uh, there's no um. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I appreciate your patience and your leadership on this issue. I'm very pleased that the council will be voting today on my resolution, which calls on Congress to pass legislation to abolish ICE and establish a more humane in, uh, immigration enforcement system. Uh, about hashtag abolish ICE 
has resonated because at its core, it represents a willingness to reshape our institutions to <coughs> rectify injustice and move toward a more humane place. In its 16 years, ICE has racked up an appalling and infamous record of abuses while failing to keep our country safer. The pending federal legislation, H.R. 6361, would create a task force to review the truly essential functions currently under the jurisdiction of ICE and transfer them to other federal agencies while eliminating those that fail to serve a public safety or national security purpose. The conversation to abolish ICE is similar in many ways to the discussion of closing Rikers here in New York City. Yes, there are practical and political challenges. Yes, transforming institutions is hard work, but it must be done. It means starting with the goal of justice and designing institutions to achieve it rather than starting with existing institutions and allowing them to limit our conception of justice. I really want to thank <coughs> Council Member Carlos Menchaca and Speaker Johnson for their incredible leadership and support on this issue, and we look forward to the resolution's passage. Thank you. Uh, finally, we're joined, of course, by Councilmember Gibson uh, as well. Finally, the council will vote <clears throat> on a comprehensive school planning and siting legislation package, which would aim to eliminate overcrowding at the city schools by increasing transparency about the process and how we select schools. As we continue to kick off the new school year and encourage New York City students to thrive in the classroom, we must continue to be committed to providing stellar resources and increasing the quality of our schools and other educational facilities. Uh, for too long, we've allowed our children to learn in schools that are overcrowded. Students who are educated in overcrowded environments are at a disadvantage in an increasingly competitive world. The greatest city in the world deserves education and facilities to match it. While the city has made significant new investments in our children's education, there is more that we can and must do. Earlier this year, the council released a report entitled Planning to Learn, the School Building Challenge. The, the, uh, this report examines challenges faced when planning for and siting new schools, which can lead to school overcrowding. The report and its recommendations were a result of a year-long review of the, of the process by an internal council working group, and today we're taking action. That started under Speaker Mark Viverito and under uh, Finance Chair Julissa Ferreras, and uh, we continued that work in this uh, new year, in this new council. Introduction 449A, sponsored by Councilmember Danny Drum, would require the Department of Education to post online maps showing the geographic boundaries, known as subdistricts, used by the Department of Education and the School Construction Authority to identify where <coughs> new capital funding will be targeted for building new schools. Introduction 461A, which is also sponsored by Danny, would require the Department of Citywide Administrative Services to provide written notice to the Department of Education and the School Construction Authority within 30 days after city-owned or leased property of at least 20,000 square feet is determined to have no current use. These are good bills. I invite Councilmember Danny Drum to come forward and speak on these bills. Thank you. Thank you for the compliment, too, uh, Mr. Speaker. As our students head back to school, it's important to keep in mind that many of our schools are unacceptably overcrowded. As a former teacher, I can attest to the challenges created by classrooms that can reach or exceed 30 or 34 students. I want to thank Speaker Johnson and Chair Traeger for continuing the Council's work to address the need to increase the number of seats in districts throughout the city. The package of bills that we'll be voting on today is the outcome of years of work on this issue. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge my predecessor as finance chair, Jalissa Ferreras Copeland, who was critical to jump-starting this process. During my tenure in the council, I have worked to improve the process by which the city identifies and develops space for new schools. Today's legislation will accomplish that by ensuring that city agencies involved in the process share relevant data with each other and with policymakers in a timely manner. When enacted, this package will help drive down school overcrowding and increase the number of seats in classrooms across
across the five boroughs, all of which represents a great victory for our public school families. And just to finally say too, the need for the sub-districts is because oftentimes, if you just look at a district as whole, it doesn't look quite as uh, overcrowded as it, as it seems to be, but if you look at specific pockets within that district, that's where the overcrowding occurs the most. And that's why getting these sub-district maps is so vitally important. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Before we go into the next bill by Councilor Burkillis, I want to invite Councilman Machaca to come up and speak about the resolution that we are doing Thank on RDC. He's been such a leader on this. Thank you, uh, Speaker Corey Johnson, uh, Councilmember uh, Helen Rosenthal, Carlina Rivera, and really the entire commission, our committee of immigration for hearing and passing the bill today. Uh, the Trump administration's zero tolerance family separation policy uh, has drawn much needed attention for the abuses perpetrated by ICE, the Federal Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. But the crisis didn't start here, and the debate around what to do with ICE is not as complicated as some would have you believe. It boils down to one very basic truth, that ICE, when it was created, uh, not some more, 17 years ago, was created to improve public safety, was created to include better communication within agencies to keep us safe, to keep our country safe. We believe, I believe, that it has failed. Uh, instead of targeting and prioritizing human trafficking or terrorism, ICE is going after our dreamers, day laborers, and loving parents. We spend almost $18 billion on immigration enforcement. That's more than the budget of all the other law enforcement agencies combined, like the FBI, the DEA, the ATF, the Secret Service. And just recently reports, and I think that this might have been talked about and should be talked about, is that we are seeing reports that Trump actually removed ICE from FEMA as we see this hurricane barreling through uh, the Atlantic coast to hit uh, the East Coast very soon, removed it from FEMA and put it into ICE. This is what we're talking about. This is the basic truth. And last week we held the first in the nation public hearing on abolishing ICE. We heard from experts, people directly affected. There was so much um, uh, to glean from this testimony. And this is the first step in having a national conversation uh, so that we can really inform this topic. While policy recommendations need to be considered carefully and crafted, the information points to a clear mandate. We got to get, let go of ICE. We have to abolish it. And so we can do this without jeopard jeopardizing our national security, and we can still keep our city safe. In fact, immigrants, when they are cooperating with our local PD, when there is relationship between our community, we have safer communities. Uh, and so that is what real people are telling us. That's what real academics are telling us. And so we are virtually the only municipal body in the country with an official immigration committee with the authority to oversee these complex conversations. And that's why I'm so proud to be serving under the speaker, under this incredible council. We must move this forward. And so I'm in support of this resolution today and so proud that we'll be passing it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, next, introduction 729A, which is sponsored by Councilmember Ben Kalos would require the Department of Education to post online the process, data, and criteria used by the department and the school construction authority to calculate the number of seats to be built to meet future enrollment needs. This is extraordinarily important uh, for our neighborhoods and communities across the city that uh, need transparency on this, so I invite Ben to come up and discuss this. Our grade schools are 106% overcrowded across the city of New York. And as we plan, the uh, School Construction Authority has told us year after year that there is no need. Cranes everywhere, there is no need. More construction here in New York City than ever before, but there is no need. That is what we heard from SCA for five years of budget hearings. And uh, when they said there is no need, we said, let's look at the data. And they wouldn't let us see the data that was allowing them to come back to us and say, there is no need at the same time as our schools are overcrowded. And uh, I want to uh, thank our, our former education chair, Danny Drum, for his leadership on this with then finance chair, Julissa Ferreras and Speaker Viverito and the fact that uh, Corey has come on as speaker, continued that work, gotten that report published, gotten it out, 
and push forward on negotiating this legislation. Uh, there's a lot of controversial bills today, but my understanding is this may have been one of the most controversial uh, because moving forward, communities throughout our city and elected officials will be empowered to look at the information that SCA is getting and putting out and say, why didn't you account for that new building going up with a thousand units? What about that area of the city that just got rezoned? Where are our schools? And we're hoping that the city might finally start planning so that when the construction is complete and the kids are looking for a seat, that they can find it. In my district, uh, we have thousands of children who are being told that, uh, and, and just to talk about sub-districts, I just opened a new pre-K center in District 2, which is where we're standing. So I opened a pre-K center on 95th Street and 3rd Avenue, and then I got on the train, rode it for 40 minutes to an hour to get here to the other end of the district, which incidentally is where they're sending a lot of the kids from my neighborhood on the Upper East Side, because this is one school district, and without that sub-district information, uh, we're not really able to advocate for our local communities because a school seat here counts for a school seat up there. And I think that just to put a fine point on it. I want to also thank our new education chair, Traeger. And uh, this was done with a lot of help from our staff. Jeff Baker, Samita Deshmukh, Beth Golub, who worked on this for months and months and had a very tough negotiation. And if I may also just speak to some of the affordable housing that we're voting out through the committee as chair of the Planning Dispositions and Concessions Committee. Uh, we had 1,000 units going through third-party transfer, uh, which will preserve affordable housing. But what we saw was HPD was interested in preserving it for people at 150% of AMI. That means an individual making $109,000 a year was going to be getting affordable housing. And if you need to build affordable housing for people making six figures, there's something wrong. So we were able to work with HPD. They've lowered the term sheet on this program for these thousand units and moving forward down to 120% of AMI, which comes out to $87,000 a year, which is still very high, but it's a $30,000 step in the right direction towards building more affordable housing for people who are real New Yorkers because half of our city makes less than $50,000 a year. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. And uh, finally, uh, introduction 757A, which is sponsored by Vanessa Gibson, uh, would require the mayor to create an interagency task force on school siting to identify potential city-owned properties for school siting and identify vacant lots that may be good candidates for new schools. I want to invite Vanessa to come up and say a few words. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Speaker Corey Johnson, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon to all of my colleagues. I'm really grateful to be here um, in the City Council at a time when overcrowding in our schools seems to be at an all-time high. Today's passage of our comprehensive package of legislation to address overcrowding, to identify school seats, is really about our commitment to our children in this city. And I'm proud to be a part of this package, and our bill, Intro 750 really is aimed at citing uh, new schools in our city as the city's population continues to grow and there is an urgent need for more school seats we find many of our children are in overcrowded classrooms and in overcrowded schools. And with a greater demand for more school seats, our legislation will truly recognize the need to create an interagency task force, which will include the School Construction Authority, the Department of Education, the City Council, and led by the Mayor's Office to collaborate on ways to identify potential school sites and opportunities to expand our network to address school overcrowding. Although the SCA already has real estate divisions, uh, which work with several real estate firms that are responsible for finding adequate sites for our new school seats, our efforts are really aimed at improving the overall communication in a collaborative fashion with multiple agencies who are all tasked to develop more sites and really work uh, with all of us. This bill would also require the task force to consult with experts on environmental issues as well as members of the public, including public school parents and advocates and the larger public across the city. Um, I am very grateful for this bill and this overall package because I just completed my three-year Jerome neighborhood rezoning plan 
And in that plan, we were able to solidify two sites for two brand new schools. One site was a city-owned site in School District 10 in Councilmember Cabrera's district. And in my area, in School District 9, Subdivision 2, uh, we identified an urgent need. And we were able, we as in my office and my staff, we traveled around our district and we identified three privately owned sites and sent the information to the SCA and now we have identified one of those sites and the city is going to acquire it and build a school for 458 students. We did that, not the real estate firms and not the real estate consultants. And the reason this bill is so important is because if everyone had the same conversation at the same time about the same purpose, we can expedite this process, get these schools built in an expeditious fashion, and really realize that we must work together. And so I'm deeply grateful for the long commitment from our former speaker, our former finance chair. I am thankful for Speaker Johnson, for finance chair Danny Drum, as well as our education chair, council member Mark Traeger and the entire staff. That report that we released truly, truly recognizes that this is an, a need that we must fulfill and certainly an urgent pressing need that our children simply cannot wait for. So I'm grateful that today we will pass this package of legislation. I want to thank everyone, especially the staff, for your hard work. And I look forward to our continued work, even beyond today, to recognize and continue to address school overcrowding in the city of New York. Thank you, Speaker. Thanks, thanks Vanessa, as always. <laughs> Uh, resolution 286, sponsored by Councilman Richie Torres, calls upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the governor to sign legislation that would give New York City and any public authorities or public benefit corporations, including the School Construction Authority, broad authority to utilize design, build, delivery methods for capital projects. Councilman Torres could not join us today, but I thank him for this. It's very, very important. We talked about this similarly as it relates to NYCHA earlier this yeah, year and yeah. getting capital projects done for NYCHA. And I think uh, really the city of New York should have design build authority for anything we want to do. And lastly, resolution 289, sponsored by Councilmember Paul Vallone, would call on the school construction authority to more clearly communicate to the general public how city residents can submit potential school sites and the guidelines used by the School Construction Authority in considering whether a suggested school site meets the evaluation standards used by the authority. Council Member Vallone could not join us today, but I want to thank him. As you can see, we're doing a lot on uh, education stuff, school siting. Uh, very proud of the work the council's done. So that concludes the agenda for today's uh, stated meeting, and I look forward to proceeding with today's votes. Uh, and happy to take any of us, or happy to take any questions on any of the items that we just discussed. Anything on topic? Yes, Jill. I don't think many other jurisdictions, municipalities have have done this. They've changed the process for amending your birth certificate, uh, and that's what the initial bill from 2014 did when I chaired the health committee. In the past, you had to have had what they called corrective surgery, physical surgery, to actually change your birth certificate. We changed that uh, and said you just need an affidavit from a medical professional. This changes even further by saying you don't even need a medical professional to say anything. You self-attest, and you don't have to choose male or female. You can choose a third uh, sort of undesignated gender. I don't know of any other jurisdictions that have done this across the, the country. Is staff here that knows? Canada? Okay. Yeah, I mean, there are plenty of New Yorkers who don't identify as either male or female um, who 
uh, you know, gender is a spectrum for many folks, and uh, it's not a fixed thing. And so for New Yorkers who are transgender, who are gender nonconforming, who are non-binary, to have an option to better self-identify on uh, such an important document, which is a birth certificate, with, uh, which unlocks all sorts of things for them, whether it be uh, enrolling in college or being entitled to uh, programs that the city offers. Many New Yorkers are required to use their birth certificate to access those programs. And if you don't have something as basic and essential as a birth certificate that identifies you as who you really, be who you really are, um, it's a problem. And so I'm really proud that we did this in 2014. It's actually probably the bill I'm most proud of from the last session that I was involved in because it, I think we've had, um, I don't have the exact number, but we got an update and I think there were almost um, a thousand New Yorkers who in the last three years have gone and been able to get an accurate birth certificate, which is very, very meaningful for them and meaningful that I was involved in that. Uh, I'm so happy to have Aaron Durkin back with us today. Aaron, yes. You missed us. I think X is there as a non-binary gender designation. It's where people, of course, don't identify as either one, and it would replace the current designation uh, for individuals who are born intersex, uh, and that designation on the birth certificate is currently four kind of stars, is what they used to denote someone who's intersex right now. This X is kind of an option where, again, if you're non-binary or don't identify as either one, uh, you get to choose that. F the reason why it's so important um, and why it's critical for folks who, who um, want to change their birth certificate is if you are a transgender individual or someone that has transitioned and your documents, for whatever reason, were not updated, your birth certificate wasn't updated, your driver's license wasn't updated, uh, whatever you had wasn't updated, and you go somewhere and you present the identification you have, and this happens all the time for people in that situation, and someone says, that's not you, you're lying. You're committing fraud. What are you doing here? And they create a scene, and there have been potential, there have been incidents of violence against people, um, so to actually have uh, a certificate that matches who you are, uh, you know, it, it's not just the importance of unlocking the things you deserve, it also gives that individual a level of internal comfort, a level of safety, mm -hmm. that they're gonna be okay when they're in average everyday situations to not be harassed and to not be questioned, is that really who you are? And uh, incidents, of incidents of violence against transgender people across the country uh, is exceedingly high, and there has been a real epidemic of violence against transgender women of color in New York City, uh, murders over the last many years. And so um, there is a real urgent need for us to continue to recognize the importance of helping transgender New Yorkers and gender nonconforming and non-binary New Yorkers to be able to self-identify and get documents that help them uh, live as full citizens here. Vince? On the uh, Jersey Envoy view, or on, on this person, um, do you envision this as a full-time job that's temporary during the shutdown, and, uh, or is it a part-time thing? Um, and are you modeling off of another Envoy person position at other city agencies you know of that this role helps with? I'm not sure about the role as it relates to other uh, city agencies, but the person better be full-time. <laughs> You're probably gonna need more than one person uh, in that office, that ombudsperson's office. I mean, the number of people who uh, take the L train every single day and who are gonna be affected both on the Brooklyn and Manhattan side is going to be enormous. And Manhattan, of course, is gonna be uh, no service between 8th Avenue and 1st Avenue. In Brooklyn, there will be service from Bedford to Canarsie along the L, but if you currently take it from Brooklyn to Manhattan, you're gonna have to get to Manhattan another way, which is gonna create a lot of problems on the bridges, 
and for traffic and why we're exploring other things, self-pedal bikes, uh, assisted bikes from City Bike, and mm -hmm. people have talked about scooters and other things. So this ombudsperson is going to have to deal with, I think, complaints in uh, a lot of different areas people aren't even contemplating yet. There is no real way to figure out what's going to happen. The DOT and MTA have been modeling projected numbers of what they think is going to happen when we put people on other subways and put people on buses and private cars, but we don't know. And that's why we need someone who's going to be responsive day in and day out to strap hangers and neighborhood residents when complaints come up. 311 is in, you know, 311 is there for a reason, but you're going to need someone dedicated mm -hmm. just on this. Right, and just to follow up, <coughs> I know they're also going to be monitoring the progress of the work. Are you not confident that the contract is going to meet the 60 month project the timeline, or is the 60 man is too soon? I am, I, I have, you know, I have no expertise on whether or not uh, these contractors are good enough to meet it, but Andy Byford is extraordinarily confident that they will meet the timeline of 15 months and that there have been uh, incentives built in uh, to do that. Rich? No. You know, when we did this in 2014 and we passed the initial bill allowing people to change their birth certificates at all without what's called corrective surgery, which is probably not a good term for it, um, about eight years earlier there was a proposal <clears throat> from the Bloomberg Department of Health, the Board of Health, to do it. And in the way, in the face of opposition, that proposal didn't move forward through the Board of Health uh, process to change it. And so in 2014, I was bracing when I was health committee chair and I had proposed this legislation to look at this, I was bracing for opposition. And it didn't come to pass, which was shocking to me. Not a single person came and testified against the bill uh, at the council. Instead, we heard incredibly moving stories of young people um, and other folks who really needed a birth certificate that matched who they really are. And I was very moved by that. And so I guess this time around, I'm not surprised that we didn't see opposition because we didn't see opposition four years ago when we initially heard the first version that put us on this path. Yes, sir. Yes. So in the second part, there is a community hearing coming up uh, on the east side of Manhattan that Councilman Rivera uh, is going to be at, and I'm going to try to be there as well to hear community uh, concerns. There's been a long process of local community meetings with the Department of Transportation and the MTA on both sides of the river, <coughs> hearing from folks, uh, answering questions. And so um, one thing that we are going to have to look at and do is throughout the shutdown, uh, from April of 2019 until the end of the summer of 2020 as the shutdown uh, is happening, we're going to need a regular interagency uh, meeting, uh, both, uh, uh, you know, uh, governmental meetings, but also public meetings to listen to strap hangers throughout the process and community residents and businesses um, who are concerned. So that's one thing that I'm going to implore the MTA and DOT uh, to look at. The community consultation doesn't end when the shutdown begins. It needs to continue throughout the shutdown. And so I think that's really important. And the ombudsperson, uh, I would imagine they're going to hear significant complaints, whether it be if you're someone who's trying to get over uh, the, the Brooklyn Bridge or the Williamsburg Bridge and, uh, you know, you're having issues or, uh, you know, what's working with HOV lanes, what's working uh, across town Manhattan. I'm sure you're going to have people on side streets who are going to be overwhelmed by traffic on my block on West 15th Street or 11th Street or 12th Street or 13th Street. There are going to be uh, a panoply of things that this ombudsperson is likely going to have to deal with, and that is why it's going to be extraordinarily important 
for the Department of Transportation and the uh, MTA to meet on a regular basis throughout the process with elected officials, community boards, block associations, civic organizations, and other groups to hear in real time what the plan is. One thing that I have really, really pressed the DOT and the MTA to be open to is to not have a fixed plan. What I mean by that is to be adaptable when we talk about 14th Street, when we talk about uh, Kenmare Square, when we talk about the bridges, what we're actually gonna do, we can't be fixed in it. We need to be open to seeing what the data is showing, what the uh, real-time information is showing. Right now, the, sh the, the, um, the hours that vehicular traffic cannot be on 14th Street besides uh, buses is 5 a.m. to 10 o'clock at night, uh, seven days a week. That might not be necessary. On certain weekends, it might not need to be 5 a.m till 10 o'clock at night. So there needs to be a level of flexibility as we go through this process. Anything else on topic? Great, off topic. Anything? I, no predictions because, uh, you know, uh, first of all, I don't believe any of the polling. I just don't believe it, you know. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was down like 30 points. Ayanna Presley was down 19 points. You know, I don't believe any of the polling. So there's no way to make a prediction, um, but I hope that everyone comes out and votes and that we see higher than expected turnout. That's the one thing that I would hope uh, all of us are telling folks over the next 24 hours is come out and vote and participate and we want everyone to take part in, in tomorrow and I hope it doesn't rain. So conceptually, I support uh, the idea of looking at alternate modes of transportation, especially in areas that have been underserved. <clears throat> but it doesn't affect my district, and so I think it's important. I'm gonna, of course, listen to uh, the seven council members that are affected by it. One of the things that, and Councilman Menchaca and I haven't had a chance to actually talk about it because we've been so busy doing other things, but I know that they removed the, the Sunset Park uh, portion out of it, which I know was a concern to him from the very beginning of the process, and instead it still goes into his district, uh, terminating in Red Hook. Um, so each council member is gonna have individual concerns, and of course, part of my uh, responsibility here is to be responsive to every council member, and so I would do that um, throughout this process. You know, I, I, I think it's a cool idea, um, do I see us getting a billion dollars from the feds? Maybe if we have a Democratic Congress and have a real trillion dollar infrastructure bill that does real work across the country. But we're gonna see what happens this November. Um, <clears throat> we need to get the Gateway Tunnel done, which I think is kind of the biggest infrastructure priority uh, probably in the United States of America uh, because of its impact. And any conversations about the BQX will be in consultation uh, with my colleagues whose districts are affected by it. Jill? Heads need to roll. I mean, it's unacceptable, despicable, um, you know, it, it, pitting communities against one, one another, lying about um, an individual. Uh, you saw a good friend of mine, Rabbi Sharon Kleinbaum, um, who is the rabbi of CBST, the synagogue that Cynthia Nixon and her children go to, spoke out about this and condemned this uh, right away. And so I, you know, this is the, the dark underbelly and worst side of politics. And it comes out typically at the end of campaigns. It's horrible to see. It's unacceptable and someone needs to be held responsible. I mean, Jeff Berman um, tweeting, don't worry, I'll take care of it, is not a good enough answer for those of us who are 
uh, members of the Democratic Party as elected officials and uh, regular individuals who are part of the Democratic Party uh, throughout this state need better answers than that, and I expect that to happen. I have no idea of knowing. I, I, it would be me speculating. I have no idea. I saw your story. Yeah. There's no way someone senior from the campaign doesn't sign off on minutes. I know you have an eight race and three pieces of mail. I did 11 pieces of mail when I ran for council in 2013, and I was. Um, uh, unbelievably neurotic about every single piece of mail, what the font looked like, what the colors were, uh, to not show my bald spot in the pictures uh, in those photos. Uh, so, you know, I, when mail gets put out, typically people are very attentive uh, to what's in that, and that's why, again, it's important for uh, someone needs to be held responsible here, and we're going to need real answers. Uh, after tomorrow, because um, I don't think we're going to get them before tomorrow, on what actually happened here, and it's it's really it's despicable. Yes, sir. Tell me your name. I'm sorry. John. John. Oh yeah. Oh John. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good to see you. Yes. 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 Um, There's not, um, but you know, as we get closer to the shutdown, we're going to be looking at all sorts of uh, things. Uh, I haven't ridden one of the scooters. I, I've seen a lot of my colleagues have been riding them in their districts and in the halls of 250 Broadway, <laughs> uh, and they look cool. Um, uh, we're going to have to figure out alternate modes of transportation in New York City, and I'm open to doing that. Anyone else, Rosa? The problem is, and we can get you some maps to show you, but in uh, a lot of school districts, and Councilman Chaka has been successful in getting three new schools? Uh, no, seven. Seven new schools There's in his district. Okay, so in his district, because there was such severe overcrowding the last five years, if you look at Councilmember Drum's district and Councilmember Moya's district and that part of Queens, if you look out in South Brooklyn and Councilmember Traeger and, and Brandon's district, uh, you have massive, massive overcrowding. And you have facilities that are unbelievably old with no set plan to open up new facilities to alleviate that overcrowding. And so what the council did under the previous speaker, Speaker Mark Viverito and former finance chair uh, Ferris Copeland, they put together a task force to look at all of the issues. And one of the most basic issues here is a lack of transparency, both for the public and for elected officials and figuring out what are the numbers what is the projected enrollment? How are they identifying sites? And what we found out throughout the process is there weren't really good answers to that. And that is why you have bills like the one Councilmember Kalos and Drum uh, and Gibson have to try to make more sense of this for us in elected office who can effectuate change and advocate on behalf of our communities, but as well as the public, parents and community education councils and PTAs and folks in the community who realize how bad the situation is, uh, but don't really have the data they need to actually be able to advocate for it as it relates to data. Does anyone else want to say? Maybe just also the fact that, you know, there's always been a tremendous undercount. Um, four years ago, uh, when we uh, established the Blue Book Task Force, they were talking about 39,000 seat uh, need, the need of 39,000 seats. Then they upped it as an outcome of the Blue Book Task Force by 44,000. Now they're saying it's 83,000. <laughs> there are estimates that the seat need is over 100,000 seats. And one of the problems is that you'd have, as my bill addresses as well, these smaller sub-districts, but if you look at the district overall, it may not seem to be as great a need for seats, but when you look at the sub-districts mm -hmm. and you know exactly in which neighborhoods the seat need is, then you can begin to address the problem. They just don't take into consideration, as Councilmember Kahlo said as well, um, the new construction that's occurring in communities. We know it, we see it, and it has not been included in their, in their estimates. And the issue of transparency, of course, is, is, is another one. And then the constant excuse by the School Construction Authority that in districts like mine, that there's no place to build schools, we don't have the property to build schools, which I believe is another piece of the legislation, which is for um, having an interagency task force. Is that yours? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
to, um, to actually find the places where we can build the schools. Is there city property that we don't look at and, and that we should be looking at? So, so right, so I think that, look, if you talk about what the real seat need is, you're talking about $4 billion extra in the budget. So there's no incentive to acknowledge or to say, you know, we need $4 billion in money in funding to fund that real seat need. So where does that money come from? And that's the problem. So if you acknowledge it, then you have to fund it. And I think that's really what it comes down to ultimately. Any other questions? I want Scott Summer. Uh, I'm going to be running around to a bunch of um, election night parties for some of the uh, IDC challengers. So I'll be I'll be running around the city. Well, I saw Zach Fink say we're not sure there's an official party yet. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Exit stage. What? Uh, no, I might be with Jumani. I might be with Jumani. Uh, I I was actually asking Jumani yesterday about where his party is, and he's trying to figure that out. Well, it was originally going to be in East Flatbush, and now it's going to be in Greenpoint, but I'm very proud of you, Monty. <laughs>